Carl Saxon up here as he leads us through more of the book of James. And I should watch what I say given the message is coming. <laughs> It is great to be with you this morning. How am I doing? Am I coming through yet? Good. That's that's great. Well, uh, welcome on the first day of winter. Uh, <laughs> I do love Minnesota. Yesterday I looked at our uh, temperature gauge and it was in the 90s. This morning I looked and it was in the low 50s. That's 40 degrees. So where can you go and get summer one day and winter the next? Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty good. Well, uh, it's been a delight to be with you, and I enjoy it, and look forward to next week as well. Today we're going to be tackling the third uh, chapter of James, but um, I don't know if you've ever had the, the need to call your local police to get them out to the house to look at something. You know, we've got an adage for that. And by the way, I have great appreciation for law enforcement and the work that they do. Having said that, you know, what's the phrase we use? Where's a cop when you need him? You know, and the second line is at the donut shop. But, you know, it's not fair. It really is not fair. But anyway, this, this is an incident that happened in Meridian, Mississippi. And it happened to a man by the name of George Phillips. George uh, was an elderly man and was going to bed when his wife told him that she heard something and left the light on in the garden shed. She heard something in the back and said, you need to look out there and see what's going on. She could see from the bedroom window, so George opened the back door to go turn off the light, but saw that there were people in the shed stealing things. He phoned the police who asked, is anyone in your house? He said, no, but some people are breaking into my garden shed and stealing from me. Then the police dispatcher said, all patrols are busy. You should lock your doors and an officer will be along when one is available. So George said, okay. He hung up the phone and counted to 60. Then he phoned the police again. Hello. I just called you a few seconds ago because there were people stealing things from my shed. Well, you don't have to worry about them now because I just shot them, killed them both, the dogs are eating them right now, and he hung up. <laughs> Within five minutes, the police, six police cars arrived, a SWAT team, and a helicopter. Two fire trucks, a paramedic, and an ambulance showed up at his house. They caught the burglars red-handed, got them. One of the policemen said to George, I thought you said that you'd shot them. George said, I thought you said there was nobody available. <laughs> Well, how do you get some help when you need it, huh? You have to think creatively along the way. Well, uh, let's turn to the book of James this morning, and uh, we'll make our way into the third chapter of James. Uh, let me pray again for us. I appreciate so the prayers. Uh, I'd like to lead us again. Dear God, we uh, thank you for your great love, your care for us. Help us to live a life that is honoring to you and obedient to you. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. O Lord our God, our rock and redeemer. Well, we've been making our way through the book of James. It's a very practical book. It's kind of your how-to book for Christian living. It was written during a time when the Jewish people were leaving their homeland and city. They were leaving because of persecution. They were losing their jobs. Their homes were being confiscated. Their lives were in danger. Many were leaving because they didn't know what else to do. So James is writing to instruct and encourage them as they have spread out through the land and 
encourage them to live out Christian lives. Now in chapter 1, perhaps you'll remember, they were facing trials. And you remember he kind of gave them instruction about trials. When you have trials, if you persevere and endure and honor God in that, you will be stronger and become mature. We also went on, and James talked about temptations. He said, I urge you to be wise and discerning and to not fool around with temptations. Because when we get tempted, if we take hold of it and nurture that temptation, it very easily slides into sin. In other words, if you play with fire, you're ultimately going to get burned. Now last week we looked at one of the gems that James gave the people that went out. And that was a simple insight on how best to get along with others. If they were a part of the Christian community or out in the secular world in which they lived. As he moved along he gave them a way to find help in living in such a manner. Now James acknowledges that you cannot do these things. Standing up to, to temptation living through trials in an honorable way. You can't even get along in Christian community ideal without the law of love. Look into Jesus, who is love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. So if we want transformation in our lives, if we truly want to honor God in all things, we're going to need help. And we get help by looking at Jesus and letting Jesus look back at us and fill us with who he is, his love, his care, his compassion. In chapter 1, verse 5, James invited his readers to acknowledge the need for wisdom and then look to God for it. In this chapter, he goes beyond that admonition to deal with the very issue of what God-given wisdom is and how we can recognize it. To do so, he deals with three specific matters. So I'm going to ask you to join me this morning in kind of settling in on these manners, matters and trying to extract from them insight for our daily living. There are three things, and we'll go back and then pick it up. The first is the awesome responsibility of serving as a teacher. Do you know how reluctant I am to be up here? Careful. Yes, exactly. And in some ways, that keeps you from entering in enthusiastically, vibrantly, because you're, I don't want to step on this, I don't want to step on that, I need to be careful. So we're going to look at that a little bit. The second thing is in verses 2 through 12, and I think this will find all of us a little bit. The tongue, and how we control the tongue. And then lastly, he finishes with the need for God-inspired wisdom. Well, let's consider for a moment verse 1. And in verse 1 he says, Not many of you should become teachers. I remember as I was entering seminary, I uh, was part-time at a local church in youth ministry. And one Sunday evening I was called to teach that Sunday night on a passage of Scripture. It was a crowd a little bigger than this in the Sunday evening service. But as I started to teach, I went along, and it was fair for people to kind of raise their hand or just ask a question. And so I looked at a hand that was right over there. And there I saw one of the smartest Old Testament professors that I had ever met. This man was one of the few evangelicals that were invited to the Vatican to study down in the lower echelons of the Vatican. And so he asked a question of me, this young green kid. I do not remember what the question was. I have no idea what the answer was. I mumbled through something. 
Now, to, to the man's credit, I was very grateful. He didn't correct me. If I was wrong, I don't even know if I was wrong, if he just wanted me to amplify what I was talking about. But I'm so grateful he was gracious and kind not to say anything right there. Um, the thing that struck me in that is when you're teaching, there are several things that are critical. Authenticity. When I tell you some of these things, part of it, you can ask yourself, does that guy seem to be the genuine article? Do you think he is what he says you ought to do? Um, sometimes I've been in settings where I wasn't too sure that I was getting from someone how they actually lived. They were telling me how I ought to live, but was it authentic? So I think authenticity is a critical thing that we look for with teachers. There's another word that came to my mind. Is it true to the word of God? You know, is it true? Is there accuracy in what the person is saying? Now, I know we can get picky units when it comes to some things, but anytime you listen to someone, you need to run it through a grid. And what is the grid that you run it through? The Word of God. Is he consistent with and is it accurate with the Word of God? Thirdly, is it authoritative? Does this person speak with conviction and with confidence? You want conviction and confidence in the one who is speaking. Now there's several hazards about being a teacher. One is you can feel so overwhelmed with inadequacy that you don't teach with confidence and conviction. It took me five years of being in ministry before I asked, or I was finally asked, Dale, do you want to seek ordination? Now ordination is when the church and the leadership of the church comes and says, this person has the gift of teaching and the calling to teach. And we want to affirm that. We want to ordain that person. I was hesitant to ask for ordination because first of all, I'm kind of dumb. <laughs> you know, I just met so many people who were smarter than I was. I mean, brilliant people. They knew the Greek back to the, was it imperative or indicative or was it all on the ground? I, you know, I wasn't sure. You know, I studied Greek, I did that, I can do a little bit with that, but it, it, it wasn't easy for me. Just a couple of years ago, I got a call from a friend. Uh, we haven't seen him for 40 years. He and I sang in a quartet together back in college days. He was a man who went through college. He had a Bible major. He went on to seminary. And at seminary, he studied the New Testament, became an excellent expert in New Testament, and went into doing, a, doing pastor. That was the last that I had heard of him, from him. And so uh, I thought, well, is it, let's get together. He was coming through the state of Minnesota. I said, let's have, let's have lunch together. So we sat down and had the lunch together. He then told me a little bit more of the story. His wife was a registered nurse, and for some time she had pursued a master's, and so he had done some other things while she was doing pursuing her master, master's. Well, when she finished that and they moved down to Indiana, he decided it was time to further his work in New Testament. He was doing a doctoral thesis on the book of John from the University of Notre Dame. And he was doing very well, but his primary mentor for that thesis left the university. Well, when that happens, it's kind of like the person lets go of your hand and you drop in the mud. And it kind of happened. Bob's thing went down. They brought in a new professor. The new professor said, I don't want you doing that study. I want you to do a little different study. Well, you know what kind of effort and energy it takes to do a doctorate. So, he, uh, he, he's quit the university, 
and he continued doing what he had done part-time for years. Bob drove over-the-road truck for 17 years. Now, the only reason I tell you that is he is still a brilliant fellow. And he is, he is a godly man. But the door didn't open for him to be in full-time teaching or preaching. Now, I don't know why. Was it circumstance? Was it God kind of shutting the door for him? I, I, I'm not sure. But there are some of us along the road who are inadequate, and yet God says, I want you to teach. All right. So you stand up. You try and do your study to be accurate. You try to do your word and live authentically with it. And you try to speak with confidence and conviction. So that's why I often ask, pray for me. Pray for your pastors. Pray for your teachers. They have a tremendous load on their plate. Not only from the external, but from the internal. How do they feel about that? I've also, <laughs> I've often been a little skeptical, and this is just me. If some guy is 11 years of age and he says, I'm going to be a preacher and I'm going to teach. Okay, I, I hope you know what you're talking about here because there's a journey involved. Part of teaching is amplification. You know, to take a text or an insight and amplify what it means. And we have had pastors at Eagle Brook, I guess two now, <laughs> that are excellent at amplifying something. They take an incident out of daily life and show how God was at work in this context. Whether it was their kids in the backyard, their dog biting the neighbor, or, you know, whatever it might be. There was no dog biting the neighbor, by the way. But uh, part of teaching is amplification. One needs to be careful it doesn't become exaggeration. That dog was not as big as a bear. You know, that big, uh, you know, type of a thing. Try to tell the stories truthfully. One time I was taken aside by a parishioner, I was on a multiple staff, and they told me of this colleague who would often speak, and their criticism was, he is always the hero of the story. You know, sometimes we're not the hero of the story, we actually are the one who made it a problem in the story. So how do you tell the story, amplifying it, being accurate, authoritative, and authentic at the same time. Underlying this responsibility of teaching is the slippery slope of power. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's a heavy thing to be teaching. How many other people get to stand before a crowd this loud, loud and large and speak? each week. How many teachers get to stand before thousands and teach and preach? Man, that is really something that they want you to speak and you to teach. It can elevate a person beyond what God intended for them. Each week when I've concluded a teaching talk, here's what my prayer is as I leave the building. I pray that the Lord would blow away the chaff and allow the seed of his truth to take root and transform in the life of the listeners. God, blow away the chaff that came with my talk. Bring your truth to bear in our lives. And always humbly so. If I don't run into humility, I'm a bit hesitant. I'm a bit reluctant when there's not humility in the room. And by the way, when you get around some very smart, accurate teachers, preachers, uh, uh, seminary people, pastors, uh, it can be heady conversation. And I just hope I love it when I, not only is the conversation heady, but there's humility. It says we really need to submit this to Jesus. Trust him for that. Well,
teaching. Many of you teach, and I bless you for that. We need teachers. We need godly teachers. But I tell you what, God's going to hold us accountable for the words that were said and our deeds and what we bring. That's the first thing that he takes on this morning. Secondly, and it's perhaps the toughest challenge for all of us, in verse 7 and 8, we read, All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. As I started to think of the tongue this week, some words came to my mind. And sometimes we refer them to the, uh, the attitudes or actions of our insights. But we've been talking about faith and works. And so this tongue is something that works for us. Very few of us cannot speak. So let me introduce a couple of things that I saw that said, here's some dangers that exist with our tongue. How about complaining? You ever been around somebody who complains all the time? The food wasn't good enough. My bed was hard. I don't like my neighbor. I don't like our church. There's not a seat for me. There isn't a, you know, the music is just beyond. You can't even handle it. I want to complain some more and some more and some more. My friends, it should not be so among you. We are not to be complainers. Now, I think it's important to distinguish the difference between complaining and critiquing. Now, very few of us are invited to critique, but we pretty much do it every Sunday on the way home. I remember years ago at community college, I was asked to be a part of a group. You would listen to people giving their students speeches. You were supposed to critique them. Were they loud enough? Were they, did it make sense what they said? You know, and they went on and on and on. You had different things. You would check. Uh, what was hard for me a little bit is because I too had to give a speech. And it's devastating to hear, to see people go, well, it didn't make much sense. He mumbled through most of it. I couldn't understand him. Uh, you know, oh good, I'm sure glad I gave that speech. You know, but Critiquing is intended to help a person become better in the context of what they're doing. So be sure you distinguish. Have they asked you to critique whatever it is is going on? The message, the music, whatever. If they haven't asked you to critique it, stop complaining. Secondly, what about liars? We aren't supposed to be liars. Um, now that can be kind of a slippery slope because some of us get very good at telling part of the truth. We don't want to tell the whole truth because we think it might even be hurtful and painful to the other person. So I just am not going to tell you. Well, how do you think I did? Well, it was, it was not bad. Actually, it was lousy. You know, and we... We sometimes pull our punches with half-truths. So, speaking the truth in what? In love. We need to learn, Lord, help me to speak the truth, but to do it in a very loving way. And Lord, keep me from being a liar. Yeah, well, there's some others I want to get to quickly. What about being two-faced? Or duplicitous. When we talk to each other, we say, you're the best. You're the best. As soon as you walk away, yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> you know, do you know what I think of him or her? Or do you know what he does, she does? Our tongue gets us in trouble. It doesn't hurt to bring Elmer's glue with you. <laughs> or duct tape. Duct tape has a lot of benefits. Bring a roll with you. Right across the top. Are we 
only being two-faced, not being, uh, if you'd say, accurate or authentic with others. What about exaggerators, flatterers? Um, I have two uncles that would visit our home every once in a while. And Uncle George and Uncle Buster. I mean, they didn't stop doing this till they went home, and I don't think they stopped then. But I have never heard such exaggerated tales in all my life. I'm just a little kid. I thought, man, when they went fishing, every fish they caught was this long. When they went around their neighborhoods, they, you know, helped do this, and then they must have transformed more neighborhoods than I could count. I mean, they were just talkers and exaggerators in talk. So I had to learn to kind of sift through that and try to see what they were saying and where they were going. Well, what about caustic? You ever met any caustic people? As soon as you say, they can turn a phrase and just make it bite. And if, if that's your spiritual gift, I would urge you <laughs> to pray about your caustic speech because it can be so destructive. It goes with its sister, sarcasm. Now, sarcasm is typically funny, and if you've ever played any sport and lived in a, in a locker room for any amount of time, that's the primary uh, milieu of athletes. You know, you couldn't beat your mother on a down and out. You know, I mean, it's just on and on. You're just not good enough. It's sarcasm. Now, it's intended to go off your back like a duck. I remember in the first church that I was a part of, uh, there was a young girl in the church that she was such a delight to kid because she didn't get it for about 30 seconds. <laughs> and everybody was just going, oh, oh, yeah, that's right. And so we had fun at Jody's expense. And I remember one time as a group, we were headed into the sanctuary and we'd been having fun with something about Jody. I remember she was ahead of me in the line and I walked behind her and she stopped and she sort of turned around and said, you know, sometimes it just really hurts. I thought, Dale, you need to curb that funny sarcasm that you think is so wonderful. And you need to tell the group, curb it because it's hurtful and painful to people. Caustic sarcasm. Uh, we need to watch slander as well. Um, one of the things that I'm aware of, and candidly, I just duck my head when I pray and say, Lord, thank you for getting me through 40-some years of ministry. Because all it takes is one person to just say something not accurate about the pastor. And it takes your credibility right down the drain, especially in smaller contexts. So slander, we need to watch out. That uh, certainly you can be sued for it, <laughs> but most of us don't get to that stage. But slander, take a look at what I'm saying about others. A couple other quick ones. Gossipers never have done that. Don't you like to be the first to know? What did you hear them talking about? What were they saying? <laughs> I got such a kick this week. Uh, Son-in-law and daughter and girls were over, and we were standing out front talking to two of our neighbors about something. Son-in-law came barreling down the street with his uh, daughter. They had been riding a bicycle. He came up right away, and he goes, Hey, what have you heard about this? And everybody kind of looked at him like, we weren't even talking about that. What are, you, what are you doing, you know? He was just stirring the pot about what we were talking about. And then he said, oh, was I not supposed to know that or say anything about that? <coughs> Bad time to ask that question <coughs> after you stuck your foot in it. Um, but do you gossip? And that's one to watch out because I think all of us want to know. I don't want to be the last person in line. Did you hear this? I've never heard a thing about it. Well, the 
was that so bad? For some of us who feel like, no, I need to elbow my way in to hear what the end is. So be careful. Gossip is sin. And I will tell you, each one of these I've named is sin. Complaining, lying, two-faced, exaggerating, caustic, sarcastic, slanderous, deceptive, gossipers, critical, and backstabbing. It should not be so among you. Control the tongue. I want to quickly tell you a story about Jack. Perhaps some of you have heard that story. I've told it uh, 25 years ago here. But I want to tell you about Jack. It was years before that that our family moved to a city where I was called to be a pastor. We moved in next to a family that we hardly ever saw. In the mornings, they would open the garage door, vehicles would back out, and then they off went off to work. All night, or at night, you may see a vehicle go by that you recognized as theirs, but it would disappear into their garage and the door would go down. I didn't know if there were people driving that, of course, this was before, you know, these automatic cars that go around all the time. At the time, I owned a snowblower, which, by the way, was my great evangelism tool. Because one night, a big cold snowstorm dropped a load of snow, snow. So I decided I would head out with my snowblower and begin my campaign of evangelism. However, the snow was so thick that it dropped about this much snow. It was wet, and you really couldn't get it to go through the snowblower. So I had to give up on my snowblower and trade it in for a scoop shovel. So I started scooping down the driveway, and I was, as I was working, I glanced up, and sure enough, here's this neighbor that I hardly ever saw. His head was down, and he was scooping snow. Since I'd not met him, I decided to get acquainted. However, every time I would stop sh shoveling and look up, he would stop shoveling, or stop looking up and look down. Uh, finally, I thought, this is a game. I'm going to catch him one way or the other. I would look out of the corner of my eye, watch for a moment when he stopped scooping snow, and then I'd go like this, hi! <laughs> and so that's what I did. I was scooping and I looked up and went, hi! Well, he went, hi! And looked back down and that was pretty much it at that time. That was my introduction to Jack. Well, over the next couple of years, he would occasionally acknowledge me as he passed on the street. Now, the predominant feature about Jack was that he drove an old Ford pickup. It literally was a puke green color. It was one of the ugliest trucks I had ever seen. A distinct memory of Jack and his truck was how he would get it started in the morning. Their house was next to ours. It was up the slope on the drive on the street. And so what he would do is he'd let his pickup roll out of the back of his garage into, into the street and then he'd let it roll down the street, and just about the time he was below my office, he'd pop the clutch to get it started. So I would hear, er, boom, and away he'd go, you know? And uh, so that's how he, he, he started his truck. Well, one time I was in the front yard when Jack came home. He had brought a camper cover, a shell, for the back of his pickup. He stopped in the street, to try and drag this shell off the back of his truck into his garage. But when I saw what he was doing, I hurried over and gave him a hand, carrying it into the garage. Well, we talked briefly, and I got acquainted with this rather diminutive, quiet man. As I did so, I began to think, this is a very interesting man. Uh, and so that was about my acquaintance with Jack along the way. As I got acquainted, I went about my business pastoring the church, and that was pretty much the extent of our interaction. But one night I came home late after a 
board meeting, of course. By the way, that's one of the nice things of not being full-time in ministry anymore. No board meetings. Uh, but I came home late. It was a dark. And as I came to the door, my wife said, say, our neighbor called and they wanted you to come over right away when you get home. So, okay. Well, it sounded like it was rather urgent. So I turned around and went out the door, crossed the lawn, knocked on the front door, and opened it to this lady that I hadn't met before. But she said, please come in. So I came in and we sat down around a, uh, the kitchen, what they call it, not bars, but the counters. We sat there and she said, well, I, uh, I have something difficult to tell you. Well, okay, what's, what's so difficult? She said, we just received word that this morning Jack took his own life. <laughs> okay, that, you know, what do you say? Not much. But he took his own life. Well, as I said, tell me a little bit about this. And she said, well, you know, Jack never felt very good about himself. His mother would always tell him, Jack, you're never going to amount to anything. I learned that Jack worked in a muffler shop. That's all. That's what he did. But his mother had made sure that he knew you're never going to amount to anything. You know what Jack had done? He had driven that puke green pickup to the city dump, put a hose in there, and asphyxiated himself. He lived out the words that his mother had ingrained in him. Jack, you're no good, and you'll never amount to anything. My friends, the tongue is vicious. It can hurt. It can wound. It can drive into the soul deep discouragement and defeat. So I urge you this morning from the book of James, uh, let's look at what he says how we handle the tongue in verse 17. The wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Look at those marks. Is that what marks your tongue? That it's pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. You will reap what you sow. You will reap what you sow. May the tongue, God help us to control the tongue so that we might be people of blessing and encouragement to others. Pray with me. God, this is such a challenging part of living the Christian life. We take our tongues with us. They pretty much start when we're born to when we die. And they get out of control sometimes. They say things that are very hurtful and painful. And sometimes they're just kind of dirty and mucky stuff. And we ask your forgiveness. Please help us. Please help us to manage our tongue that we may bring about peace and mercy others. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Enjoy your small group time.